In celebrating a century of steam railways, the choice of George Stevenson's locomotion was an obvious one. It was, after all, the first steam locomotive to be used on a public railway anywhere in the world. The contemporary engine chosen to stand alongside was one of Nigel Gresley's Pacific class locos. Locomotion itself was developed from the pioneering machinery which served the collieries. But when it came to transporting passengers, Stevenson faced an uphill struggle from those who still favoured the horse. One hundred years later, and driving a Pacific class loco had become an art. In order to get the best from his machinery, the driver had to know the track with all its kinks and turns so he could maximise and regulate his speed to perfection. The engineer, too, had to be no less skilful with his hands as he distributed the coal to all corners of the firebox to give the engine maximum pressure. Such deeds fueled the dreams of children across the world, a sensation that this film from America seeks to capture. Dreams such as these couldn't have been possible without the rocket. Built in 1829 by George Stevenson's son, Robert, it, more than locomotion, was the true progenitor of the steam locomotive as we recognize it today. It was more reliable, quicker, and able to haul heavier loads. The British public were made to realize for the first time that this invention was here to stay. The social implications of the possibility of mass movement of the populace scared the establishment in a time of violent political upheaval in Europe. What no one could have guessed, though, was the dramatic change in the shape of the country itself in the century that followed. Simple economics was the catalyst for change. Railways ensured the efficient transport of both raw materials and finished goods to larger markets at lower cost. Many complained of these so-called monsters navigated by a tail of smoke and sulphur, but their influence was irresistible. For the first time anywhere, the decisive break with an agricultural economy had been made. A huge network of industrial and passenger communication had existed before the advent of the steam railway, of course. There's an argument. The canals, far from being a product of the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries, in fact made it possible in the first place. Whatever the real truth, the fact is that as soon as the canals had reached their zenith with over 4,000 miles of waterway, the age of steam was upon them, and naturally the huge advantage of speed that the railways had made it a no contest. Speed became the enduring obsession of engine builders, no matter where they were from. After the grouping of all the many disparate railway companies into four large groups, GWR, the Great Western Railway, weighed into the speed battle with its 135-ton King George V, seen here on its way to the USA in 1927 to represent Great Britain for the centenary of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The father of the Great Western was Isambard Kingdom Brunel. As its first chief engineer, he developed the company's reputation for speed on its flagship expresses, a reputation the King class carried on. Businessmen immediately found these quick supply routes useful. Mass distribution of goods changed not only the cities, but formerly quiet port towns like here at Birkenhead, into crucial cogs in the great wheel of commerce. Britain had always been the magnet for goods from its empire, but the railways meant that no longer did it all have to travel through London first. So with railways as the supply lines, great industrial centres grew up around the Clyde, the Tyne, the Humber and the Mersey. And the railways weren't short of ideas as to how to improve distribution methods further. We live in a wondrous age. March, the one-time little wayside station in Cambridgeshire, has become a huge railway sorting and distributing centre. 
where thousands of wagons of minerals and merchandise are reshuffled into new trains. This is just a small section of the newest railway robot, which with its electrically controlled siding stems covers over 100 acres. Scientific research and inventive genius have here combined to provide the means to sort a 60 wagon train into 40 sidings in six minutes. Into this control tower, day and night, are shot instructions for the breaking up and making up of new trains. One man at the switch table sets up a number of point movements which are automatically operated by the wagons themselves as they pass clear of the points. A novel form of brake called a retarder is worked from the tower. It grips the wagon wheels and graduates the speed so that each wagon rolls with uncanny precision into its proper siding. To walk up and down these long sidings would make a pretty tiring day, for it would mean a stroll of 30 miles. Look at these wagons wandering, as it were, aimlessly over points and crossings, yet each one definitely controlled by the invisible men in the town. This you might describe as a worm's eye view of the retarder in action. And so power and progress in transportation is day and night keeping the wheels of industry turning and ever more quickly. Less spectacular aspects of railway building shouldn't be forgotten either. Just outside Boston, Lincolnshire, where thousands of sleepers are made every year for that East Coast route. It would need a calculating machine to reckon the grand total of these lanes and streets of seasoned planks, waiting their turn to be cut and creosoted. There are so many it needs a special railway line to deal with them. In the big sheds, saws are sizing up things and other sleepers are getting acquainted with the creosote impregnating tanks. Any kind of sleeper likes a chair, but not this sort. It's made of iron and is bolted to the sleeper by ingenious machines, all in a few seconds. A few minutes later, it's just one of a large family of new railway sleepers, bound for 101 distant points to smooth our track across the countryside. To run on these lines, of course, you need stock. It's a proud claim that British railway passenger stock is the finest in the world. And it's well merited, as these pictures taken at Derby will show. This is a frame-up, or rather a frame-down, of a corridor coach in the early stages of cutting, riveting and welding. That done, the main frame is fitted with wheels just to make it go along easier, and a coupling hook has to be made. This is the coupling die, and in a moment you'll see the connection. There, the mighty hammer descends on the hot metal, the workman handling the prawn-shaped links with remarkable dexterity. Every one of them's on his metal. When everything has cooled down, the coupling is fixed in position. And what of the wood? A small forest of 25,000 trees is felled every year to provide the timber used. Then the latest mechanical marvels saw it, plane it and turn it, each process being in the hands of skilled specialists. 
After each part has been carefully examined, the body is assembled and the beauty treatment begins. Of course, they'll polish until they can see their faces in it, while the men paint and show them where to draw the line. Eventually, the body beautiful emerges and is placed on a traverser for further examination. The craftsmen responsible for its construction are hailed for the final inspection, and a sterner party of critics it would be difficult to find though it's all their own work. She's off. Another product of creative brain and deft fingers goes on its way. A monument to the men who made it. there was one issue which taxed the locomotive engineer almost as much as the desire for speed, it was that of seeking total efficiency. In other words, maximizing the work done for the amount of fuel consumed. One of the major problems was how to make this calculation in the first place. G.J. Churchwood the builder of the King-class locos built this test plant in Swindon in 1904 for the Great Western. It lasted until 1959. In Britain, for a number of years, it remained unique and surely contributed significantly to GWR's success, since other companies had to travel to France to test their locos, and it took until 1948 before everyone else could enjoy the same advantages. But the Great Western did not have everything its own way by any means. The Southern Railway for one produced a famous class of locomotive, as successful as any other during the grouping era. The King Arthur class loco seen here at its unveiling in 1925 was a very powerful two-cylinder 460. It had massive frame design and was seemingly immune from running problems. And what better way to demonstrate its sheer power than to take on head to head not one, but two of the locos it was to replace. hundreds of duties on a railway. Some of the more unusual are described here. What's in a name, said Shakespeare? A lot, said the Boschman. If you're called a Boschman, you wash grease off loco parts. And if you're a hair corder, or carder, you prepare hair for railway carriage upholsters, who in his turn is called a trimmer. Many of these Swindon railway employees have most misleading grade names. The clothier is not a tailor. He just clothes engine boilers in heat-proof plaster. The dresser has no relationship to the backstage variety like this. His job is to dress rough castings with a hammer and chisel. The shingler is not a coiffure expert. He controls a giant hammer to beat out red hot metal. Some have typical gangster names. The pull-up boy opens the furnace door for white hot bars to be taken out to the roughers, who pull the metal through rollers. The puncher is not uh, one round of Brian, but a puncher of rivet holes. A close relative is the holder-up. He holds up the heads of the red-hot rivets for the riveters. And 
This chap has quite a professional title. He's the saw doctor. He keeps the saw fit for work. If the crane wants to lift something, then the ukaron has to hook it on. Those who dismantle machinery are known as strippers. They can strip anything from a watch to a railway engine. Yes, there's a lot in a name when you're as skilled as these railwaymen. What went on inside the trains, once in service, was often no less busy. The duties of the mail train was made legendary by the film Night Mail, lending the job an aura of romance. For the first time in British history, perhaps, the toil of the working class was recorded and given a glamour, the kind normally reserved for the empire builders and gentlemen soldiers of the upper classes. To work on the railways was a job to which any child could aspire. This apparatus for picking up and dropping mailbags at full speed was first introduced as early as 1838. The network of railway postal services reached a peak in the 20s, but eventually the postal authorities found it more convenient to concentrate mail traffic at a few large centres and then distribute it by road. So a small but picturesque detail of railway life was lost forever. In 1926, a nine-day general strike was called, and the British public were made to realize just how dependent they had become upon the huge webs of communication which now crisscross the country, and how beholden they were to the people who worked on them. The strike was in support of the coal miners, and for the first few days the shutdown was total. What services there were, were run mainly by middle-class volunteers. Soon the cracks began to show, and the strike started to peter out. As far as the railways were concerned, though, it didn't end before another form of transport had nailed its colours to the mast as a possible alternative. For most of the thousands of maroon travellers, it wasn't within their price range, but in America, with its vast distances, the aeroplane did indeed kill off the railways. Ultimately, though, the big four in Britain had little to worry about from a London to Birmingham air service such as this. More realistic was the challenge from the road. The main reason rail track was laid in the first place was because the horse could pull more along shiny rails than it could across rutted cart tracks. But after the invention of tarmac and the improved reliability of the combustion engine, coach travel became a serious threat. The key advantage the railways had was speed. 
just as they had consigned the canals to history with the use of it. So they hoped to do the same to the upstart bus. But with speed, sometimes there came tragedy. Within a few minutes of the heart of London, a serious train collision has brought death and injury to the workers on the crowded early morning coaches bringing them to the city. As the details come through with stark, dramatic suddenness, here are the facts as they were brought to me by telephone, teleprinter and eyewitness report. The 7.30 train to Victoria via Tulse Hill was held up by signals on the viaduct just outside Battersea Park Station. Into its rear coach at full speed crashed the train from Coulsdon ploughing its way through almost the full length of the back coach of the first train and killing the guard. Immediately it's realised that several have been killed, many injured. The services of all nearby doctors and nurses are requisitioned. Ambulances are rushed to the scene. The police hold back the surging crowds not to impede the rescue work, already made difficult by the height of the viaduct. In many a London office today, a phone call will bring news that some worker will not be at the accustomed place. In many a London office, work will be held up because some key job cannot be finished. Such is the fate that hangs always over all of us, the fate that often strikes in strange places to break the journey with such tragic suddenness. In the rail department, ladies and gents, we offer you today unique pictures of a fire brigade on a train taken at the railway works at Horwich. The men have just received a call, thanks to the persuasiveness of our cameraman. And uh, right away, guard, they're off to the scene of the fire. Meanwhile, you'll be interested to know that the brigade, which was formed 40 years ago and consists entirely of works mechanics, has already won 100 prizes for firefighting. The railways produce their own solutions to some of the dangers, although this service seems more Keystone Cops than Fire Brigade. Rushing coyly at such compliments, the firemen alight and connect the hose to the tank behind the engine. While we would just be thinking about it, the powerful pump is set in motion and 350 gallons of water a minute are being poured on the flames and they can turn out to a call in three minutes. Mechanical innovations were also introduced to help avert possible disasters, such as the so-called fog fellow. An innovation still with us to this day. Aside from protecting its staff and passengers, the railways continued with their twin obsessions of speed and efficiency. Apart from the test bed, the other way of measuring an engine's performance and the trueness or otherwise of the track was with a dynamometer car. The information came straight from the rails, looking for all the world like a cardiograph. In this case, it was the track which was being tested, and once the results were processed, workmen would set about solving the problem. The London and North Eastern Railway also fitted a phone link from the driver's cab to the dynamometer car so he could tell them about steam pressure and the volume of coal used, whilst they could measure miles per hour and the state of the track.
Ultimately, it was possible to calculate not only average speeds, but the horsepower, superheating, boiler pressure, steam chest pressure, cold use per mile, water use per mile, and finally, the level of evaporation. Acting on this knowledge, engineers like LNER's Nigel Gresley designed trains, some of which became the fastest the world had ever seen. Another LNER invention was this, the robot rail layer. The 1920s and 30s, although a golden age for British locomotive design, often found the big four in depressed circumstances. Labour-saving devices, such as these, were essential in the battle to stave off the ever-increasing challenge from the road. Pullman coach services stole the name, but couldn't possibly hope to reproduce the luxury found in the real Pullman cars. But their price advantage over the railways was huge, and the services were getting quicker all the time. But at least, during this crisis, the British rail engineer could always look abroad, since Britain wasn't only making railways for itself. There was, after all, still an empire to service. These locos from the Vulcan foundry were being loaded for duties in India. The European powers were working together to colonize and open up other continents, not hesitating to rewrite history to suit their needs as they went. Years ago, the throb of the war drum sounded and called the tribes to gather for battle. Fierce wars were waged and the prisoners that were taken were used as slaves. Throughout West Africa ran a network of slave trails. After the coming of the white men, slavery was abolished and slave trails were replaced by iron rails. The British and Portuguese between them are building a railway from Nobito Bay via Benguela here, up to Angola here, and on to Elizabethville. It is to go on into the British South Africa and link up with the Cape to Cairo Railway in Rhodesia. When completed, it will give Rhodesia a gateway to the Atlantic. The terminus of the Benguela Railway is at Lobito Bay. To make shipping easy, the train runs along the quay side. Bags of maize are being loaded 
and there goes a bullock on his way to Europe. New carriages for the railway are unshipped from a steamer which has just arrived. And now that we've seen that one safely ashore, we'll join the inhabitants of Lobito in the great excitement of the day, seeing the mail train start for up country. Look at the lines and you'll see that a narrow gauge is used. Beyond Lobito, the train runs through a sugar cane growing district. Factories are being built around here for extracting the sugar. Upper siding, the natives are loading up sacks of mealies to be marketed in Europe. The mealie train plunges down a cutting. The contraption in front of the engine is a water tank. The great distances between station and station on this line makes such provision necessary. We are going to come out on the plains below this weird looking rock called Kimbembo. The train crawling across the vast African countryside looks like a tiny insect The earth in these parts bakes into very good bricks. The finished bricks are taken to the new railway by the old transport, ox wagons. Up she climbs on an easy gradient and soon runs into Kuamba, the capital of Angola. Kuamba will be the headquarters of the Benguela Railway when these enormous railway yards are finished. To get hydroelectric power for these works, the Kwanda River, 12 miles away, is to be turned to account and a dam is being built across these falls. Wheat grows on the uplands beyond the Kwanda, and the line passes through orange groves, which produce good crops, if we can judge from this little lot. Still climbing, we come to higher country and the next stop is at the town of Silva Porto, which has a simple municipal water supply. Silva Porto is famous for its herds of cattle, which, since the building of the railway, helped to supply the home killed beef of old England. The Kwanza River is crossed by a a four-span bridge. Once over it, we run into country where in well-watered fields your morning coffee is being planted. And further on, the coffee berries are picked from full-grown bushes. These plants that look like cactus are sisal grass. The fiber in the leaves makes a very strong rope. So far, the railway has been useful chiefly for commercial transport, but soon crowds of tourists will be coming up to see these marvelous falls at Coemba. A rainbow has got caught in the spray. Beyond the falls, the Benguela Railway has been completed to the Angola-Congo border, 840 miles from Lobito. The Belgians are pushing on to complete their section of the line across the Belgian Congo.
Every day, the workers' train sets out for railhead, loaded with men and materials. This gang completes about a mile of permanent way a day. When this section of the line is finished, tourists will be able to go direct from Lobito to any point on the railways of the Congo, Rhodesia, or the Union of South Africa. Note that pressed steel sleepers are used, as wooden ones would soon be destroyed by insects. This is not a variation of the Charleston, but a way of balancing the heavy weight of the rail. Until the line through the Belgian Congo is completed, we have to go on to Elizabethville by car. The motor service is good, but a road of logs makes one remember longingly the smooth running of a railroad. Crossing the river by ferry is a tedious business, but before long the railway engineers will have put a bridge over and the train will run across. We can tell when we are approaching the town of Elizabethville because the factory chimneys stand high against the sky. Somehow, this doesn't look like the heart of darkest Africa, and it isn't, for Africa is getting lighter every minute. So, whilst the colonial powers were trying to render Africa in their own image, at home in Britain, locomotive design had entered the crucial and thrilling era of the streamliners. This Gresley design for LNER, number 10,000, appeared to general public amazement at the close of 1929. This four-cylinder compound, 464, had been many years in the making. Three years were spent on the design of a high-pressure boiler alone. But it was the aerodynamic screening at the front end which attracted most attention and prepared the way for the many great streamliners from LNER and their great competitors LMS which were to follow. LMS's most famous contribution to the streamline age came in 1937. Its coronation Scott could top 114 miles per hour and average nearly 80 miles per hour. Such trains became standard bearers for British railways worldwide, but usurpers to the crown of steam were lurking. One of them, electricity, made its first significant impact in Britain on commuter lines. Every day, every hour, this express leaves London and speeds its 60 miles an hour way southwards. And exactly an hour from the start, it runs into Brighton. Its passengers on business or pleasure bent, taking the journey as a definite event in their lives. But to the men in the signal box, the express is just another train to be guided safely to its platforms. With its 225 levers, this most modern box controls signals and points within a radius of nearly a mile. Gone are all the old heavy hand levers, for everything here is electrically operated. The signalmen don't need to see a train. They watch the illuminated diagram, which gives a complete picture of the track, with lights indicating the moving trains. The levers operate electrical contacts underneath. There are 13,000 of these. This action starts a small motor, which unbolts the points, throws them over, and secures them again. Only when the points are properly over and bolted can the line clear signal be given to the train. The same procedure takes place when levers are returned. 120 sets of points and 140 signals are controlled from the one signal box. Every movement and signal is recorded by this booking man, and they run into thousands a day.
keen-eyed and experienced, the signalmen work quietly and efficiently. For though the system is so foolproof that a mistake could not possibly cause an accident, it is their responsibility to ensure that train movements are according to schedule. So steam, excusing the pun, was under pressure from electricity and diesel. Although these technologies weren't exactly new, after all, Liverpool had had an electrified line since 1903, they were being refined to a point where they could compete with steam not only in terms of speed, but also for reliability and cheapness. This film, called A Day in the Life of an Engine Driver, follows a journey from London to Manchester with the LMS and serves perhaps, for us at least, as Steam's last hurrah, where the thrill of the open cab and the irresistible romance of these locos can be seen and enjoyed at length. The London Midland and Scottish Railway was the largest of the big four. The chief mechanical engineer for the LMS was William Stanier. Appointed to the post in 1932, he produced a dynasty of locomotives, including legends such as the Black Fives, the Princess Royals, and the Duchess Pacifics. But even he couldn't save steam from its fate. Early experiments in the use of internal combustion engines for rail traction were usually based on the petrol engine. It was Dr. Rudolf Diesel who first successfully experimented with engines using heavy oil fuel. The advantages over petrol were obvious. The diesel engine extracts more power than the petrol engine from the same amount of energy in the fuel, and the fuel cost per mile was about half that of petrol. But using diesel for rail traction had one major drawback. Because the power delivered depends on the amount of fuel burned in the cylinders on each power stroke, it develops no tractive effort until it's running, unlike the steam engine where tractive effort is effective as soon as steam is admitted to the cylinder and exerts pressure on the pistons. The diesel engine, therefore, had to be started first before it could be connected to the wheels. Germany first popularized diesel in the 1930s. Britain was slower to embrace it, although the LMS and GWR experimented with diesel for shunting and local services. It would be the 1950s before multiple unit diesels became widespread in Britain. Developments of any kind were of course severely interrupted by the Second World War. They knew their hour was approaching. These were the people of busy city and suburban street, of smiling fields and tranquil immemorial villages. These were the people that were to meet with blood and fire, that were to fight, to die. Railways became targets for the heavy bomber in an effort to disrupt supply routes. The war ended, leaving the railways in a hopelessly run-down condition, from which, denied proper investment and support, one may argue they have never truly recovered. Nationalisation of the railways took place in 1948 and the Big Four became simply British Railways. At first it seemed content to stay steam-driven, not sharing the continental enthusiasm for electrification.
there was a problem with steam. In the 1950s, an era of relatively high employment, the railways had great difficulty attracting young recruits when more regular hours at higher rates of pay were on offer for many much less arduous and responsible jobs. This shortage was given as one of the main reasons in British Rail's modernisation plan of 1955 as to why steam had to be consigned to history. Extensions to the electric lines already in place, such as those on southern routes, were given the go-ahead by the plan. By 1959, it had become possible to travel from London via Dover and Ostend to Rome, entirely by electric train. The most serious consequences of these changes were on the railwaymen themselves. Their jobs, which though not highly paid, were hitherto regarded as the safest available. They were suddenly deprived of their livelihood, often in areas where alternative employment was hard to find. Whole towns and communities were affected, and this was compounded by the closure of many of the railway workshops. The declining years of steam power in Britain saw filthy engines in deplorable mechanical conditions, with their nameplates removed or stolen, and sometimes even lacking basic external fittings. Other, sometimes quite modern engines, were scrapped with a haste and completeness which betrayed the hands of zealots at work. Elsewhere in Europe, steam was phased out gradually. The locos were maintained properly, and many services continued well into the 1970s. In all, 17,000 engines were removed from service and only a few hundred were saved from the heat of the gas cutter. Reaching cuts of 1963 were meant to staunch the dramatic losses of revenue the railways were incurring in the face of road haulage and the private car. 100,000 railway workers lost their jobs and what was left was a basic network of trunk lines for commuters, business travellers and what remained of the goods traffic. this film was made, all these upheavals lay in the future. For him, steam railways still meant four fiefdoms, distinguished by exquisite liveries like Derby Red or Malachite Green, where every young boy and many an adult envied you your job as you rode the streamliners and pacifics, the castles and the stars, and took your place in the greatest social and industrial evolution that the world had yet known. We live in a wondrous age.
It's a proud claim that British railway passenger stock is the finest in the world. What's in a name, said Shakespeare? A lot, said the Boschman. The craftsmen responsible for its construction are hailed for the final inspection. And a sterner party of critics it would be difficult to find, though it's all their own work. Blushing coyly at such compliments, the fireman alight. And there goes a bullock on his way to Europe. A close relative is the holder up. And so power and progress in transportation is day and night keeping the wheels of industry turning and ever more quickly.